what you did in the past is what you did in the past. We can't change it. The next best time to decide to take control of your financial destiny is today. Welcome, everybody, to The Chris Harder Show, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success, knowing that when good people like you make good money, they can then do great things. My name is Chris Harder, and several times per week, I will bring you epic guests, solo episodes, and every single tool, trick, and skill set you need to grow your business, grow your money mindset, and to grow your wealth to levels that you have never reached before. I've ended up in a unique place in life where I've got the experience, the connections, and all of the secrets that it takes to be successful. And I'm lifting the curtain to reveal it all to you in an effort to help put you in a position of abundance so great that you can then be as generous as possible. So let's lock arms and let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Chris Harder Show's Another Money Monday here, where we absolutely believe that both prosperity and generosity can and must coexist. Now, I know I normally do Money Mondays solo, but today I'm bringing in a good friend of mine, Mel Abraham. He's been on the show a couple of times before. I usually try and have him on at least once a year because he is a genius with personal finance. He used to own a huge accounting firm with other partners, sold it, had a success story, and now has been working on teaching personal finance to as many people as he can reach. And he's one of the smartest individuals in personal finance that I've ever met. What I love the most about him is he's also the real deal. And you'll hear me reference that in the interview. As a matter of fact, you hear he and I joke back and forth quite a bit because we are good friends. But I'll tell you, he is one of the real deals in personal finance. I'm just going to tell you blatantly, there are too many people teaching business that don't have business experience. There's too many people teaching about money that don't actually have the financial credentials that you would want from somebody that you want to learn from. Well, he is one of the true individuals individuals with the financial credentials and the education, of course, being a certified public accountant, both through trade, through education, and through experience. So he's going to talk to you about how it is never too late to get your finances in order to establish a strong and abundant retirement. If you're in your 20s, of course, it's easy, but it doesn't feel like you need to get started. If you're in your 30s, The clock's starting to tick, but you don't quite make it a priority yet. In your 40s, you start to feel like it's too late. And in your 50s or 60s, you start to panic like, man, I should have done this sooner. Well, we address all of those ages in this episode, along with some very specific examples of how you can start to beef up your retirement so you don't have to panic. At the end, he also is offering a call to action for some more free training that he's doing. So, of course, stick around for the end if you want the free training as well. All right, guys. Here we go. Take some notes because your financial future is literally at stake. Mel, my friend, how you doing, buddy? Man, I'm doing really well, man. It's always good to see you, my friend. Likewise. I mean, normally we get to see each other in person. Today, not so much. I'm up at the lake house for the summer. You're back in Laguna. Matter of fact, we should give people some context on, you know, how we become so close, like how we become such dear friends. We live right by each other when I'm, when we're at our California place. Absolutely. And, uh, we're like 10, well, we're like eight miles away, which in California could be 45 minutes. 45 minutes. It takes me 40, 45 minutes to get to your damn house going eight miles. I, I could walk or jog it quicker. I guess I couldn't, but my brother probably could. Yeah. But here's what's really neat. And, and this is not a podcast about proximity, but the power of proximity. You and I have known each other for a while and we've had mutual friends for a while and then we've done different podcasts and stuff before, but I feel like we've really gotten close the past couple of years. And it is because of proximity. It's so much easier when you can meet for lunch. It's so much yeah. easier when you can, remember we went for a walk that day for like two hours or three hours. Oh, cool. uh, it's so much we're easier just to just hang out on a whim, isn't it? Yeah. The power it, of proximity can't be replaced. Do people not just take the time to slow down enough and have conversations these days. Yeah. Yeah. And the wealth, because that's what we're going to talk about today, but the wealth in all forms that can come from creating space to spend time to ideate with people and build relationships compared to just hustle, 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 hustle. Sorry, can't do lunch. I don't have time. Sorry, can't take a walk. I don't have time. Sorry, can't hang out Saturday. I don't have time. People think they're doing the right thing. And boy, have I been there. I used to think I was doing the right thing by packing every available moment with, quote, production. But the truth is, man, you got to have a lot of that open space available for those miracles to happen. Yeah, I see. You say miracles. I say you got to leave space for the magic in life Mm -hmm. because the other side of rushing from 
space to space and all that stuff is we're not noticing the things that are right in front of us that we should appreciate or that we could have an opportunity with, which is really about us controlling our time. I agree. Another fun fact people should know before we teach them how to get rich is that our dogs, so my bonkers and bananas and your dog, Budo, have the same dad. How cool is that? They do. We're family. We're uncles and family. aunts. <laughs> we are lit. Wait, when people are like, hey, brother, so glad to have you on. We're literally family now. Yep. We made a pact. If God forbid something happens to us, you take Budo and vice versa. So we either get two dogs or or you get one. <laughs> You guys, here's, here's what's interesting. They always say, learn from the people who have been there, done that. And, and there's too many people that are, I think, charlatans trying to teach you how to get wealthy or teach you how to yeah. grow a business or teach you how to do this or teach you how to do that, teach you how to have a good relationship, right? And, and none of them are actually congruent in what they're teaching. They know how to attract you on social media, but they're not congruent in living the life that they're teaching. I have been to Mel's house multiple times that sits overlooking the most epic private beach in Laguna Beach that you can only access if you live in this gated neighborhood. And we go there to let our dogs run free. And that is their favorite thing to do on the planet. So I share that for two things. One, if you got dogs, you got to find a place for them to run on the beach. They're so damn happy. But two, when we teach you today, when Mel teaches you today, you need to know that this is a gentleman who has walked the walk for so long that that's not an old joke, by the way who has walked the walk for so long that he truly is a successful, wealthy individual in a way that we would all dream of being, who is now teaching you out of the sheer kindness of his heart because he sure as hell doesn't have to. For me, it's just, I enjoy it. I want to see people light up and I want their dreams to be lit up. Yep. Amen. Amen. Okay. So here's what I want to make sure that we are yeah. catching their attention for today. Yeah. We're going to talk about how to build a wealthy lifestyle using less money than you think, right? That That's kind of the theme. Like yeah. people, they think you have to have a windfall. They think you have to sell a company. They think you have to have some big life event, but you don't. You just have to have some planning and some common sense and someone has to show you a path. And that's what we're going to kind of illuminate today. But we're going to do it mainly for entrepreneurs and for solopreneurs. Now, what we're going to talk about, what Mel's going to teach today is applicable to anybody. So if you have a regular job, if you have a W-2 job, if you're not a solopreneur or an entrepreneur, don't worry, this still applies to you. But we're really leaning into entrepreneurs and solopreneurs with some of the things that we say for a specific reason. Do you mind sharing that reason, Mel? Yeah, here's what I found with all entrepreneurs. So you've got two sides of the equation. Let's just break it down to the basics, okay? To build wealth is no different than trying to lose weight. You eat less, move more, okay? Mm -hmm. To build wealth, make more spend less. The challenge is that the majority of the advice out there and the majority of things that people are trying to do is to sit back and say, how do I cut, 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 cut mm -hmm. in order to have more money so I can build my wealth? And I hate yeah. to tell you, I think that the reality is, is that you can't cut yourself to wealth. You have to grow yourself to wealth. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about entrepreneurs is that they actually can affect both parts of the equation, the expense side and the income side, easier. Not that you can't if you're an employee, it's just easier. And so now we can go back and say, we need more income, so let's figure out the way to make that more income, which then can accelerate our path to financial freedom. Now, as an employee, that might be limited, although I think even as an employee, we ought to be having side gigs and side hustles and multiple streams of income as a security element to knowing that we're not just relying on one stream. Yeah, Mel, let me back that up. I often teach in today's dynamic world where anything can happen and woo, we have seen anything happen. Even if you have a W-2 job, I think it's yeah. now your responsibility. I don't care where the income sources come from, whether it's investment income or whether it's a side hustle, but I think it's now your responsibility to make sure that you are building your budget and living your lifestyle so that if any one of your income sources went away today, you would not have to change your lifestyle tomorrow. Right. And yes, even if that means your job is your biggest income source, I mean, if any single one of your income sources went away today, you should not have to change your lifestyle tomorrow because you put yourself in the right position with other sources of income to be able to do that. And Mel, you actually, I don't want to go through the whole story right now, but you lived through this, right? You had a, a health issue pop up and it's one that took you out of commission for a long time. Yeah. And you didn't have to change your lifestyle 
because you've lived this rule already. Do you mind shedding a, a quick light on that? Yeah. So in 2019, in 2019, I was diagnosed. Now things were going really well. I mean, I was flying on a, not my own, but I was flying on private jet. I'm speaking. Everything's great. But literally life got turned on its head because I, two weeks after getting off one of those jets, they looked at me and said, you have a five centimeter tumor in your bladder, which mm. turned seven and a half centimeters. And and then here's here's a surgeon looking at me, my wife and my son saying, we might have to remove the prostate. We might have to put a tube and a bag in for the kidney because I can't see the urine on the right side. And if it's bad, you could lose your bladder. So mm. Like life got completely turned on its head. So in a moment, I sat back and I said, it's changed. Now my 100% focus has to be beating this. My 100% focus has to be focusing on healing and, and all of that, which meant that how do I do that? I got to shut everything down and allow myself the space to operate and do those things. And I was fortunate enough to be in a situation where I had to fight the cancer psychologically. I had to fight it physically. I had to fight it medically. I had to fight it spiritually, energetically, all of that. But I didn't have to fight it financially. Oh, man. Say it louder for those in back. This is so important because this is what derails people. Yeah. Right? This is their fear. It's what keeps them up at night. What if blank happens? How will I go on? What if blank happens? How will we stay in our house? What if blank happens? How will I pay for my kid's school? Right? This is what yeah. keeps people up. It happened to you. And yeah. you had positioned yourself correctly to not let that be a thing. That is why we're teaching today. Right? Because we understand at our age, things can and will happen. You're probably not going to avoid catastrophes your entire life. No, but they don't have to be financial catastrophes if you make the proper moves ahead of time. And that's what we're going to teach unapologetically today. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt, because I, here's the other, I think, premise of everything I do. I truly believe that financial freedom is a birthright. Yeah. And it's just a matter of understanding how to claim it. Yep. I totally agree. I would add to that. Anyone's capable of it. Yeah. I, I mean, think a lot of people come themselves out. Be, oh, my family, you know, we don't come from well, so it can't be us. Or we didn't have that kind of training growing up, so it can't be me. Or, well, I don't live in this neighborhood or I don't know these people, so I don't think it can. Anybody from all walks of life. Neither you. Legitimate shot. Neither one of us came from money. Mm -hmm. I came from an immigrant family. My father was an engineer in the aerospace industry. That was it. I mean, so we had what we needed. We had a great loving home, but it wasn't like we had limos and luxury and all of that type of stuff. Yeah. When you say that your father was in the aerospace industry, he worked with the Wright brothers, right? When they were running that airplane <laughs> off the uh, hill. I'm just kidding. So to know Mel and I is to know that, you know, he's maybe 20 years, 15 years older than me. So I like to make a lot of uh, age jokes in there. Dude, but honestly, he's in better shape than me. So that's what makes it so ironic and funny. I hesitate to say this, but I'm about five weeks from being eligible for Social Security. So, Oh, my gosh. Well, listen, we're going to position it this time as not only have you walked the walk, but that just means that you have all these years of expertise. So here we go. So we're really speaking to solopreneurs and entrepreneurs. Mel is a very successful accountant by background. It's not like he is an accountant today. He's not sitting there doing somebody's taxes, but his background, he owned a huge accounting agency back in the day. And that's always been his his trade in the past. And today he's just trying to help as many people as possible, you know, realize, wait, you don't need a big windfall. You don't need a big win. You can rhythmically will yourself into a wealthy lifestyle. So Mel, do me a favor. I want you to frame this for somebody who says, I work a, a nine to five or, you know, here I am a solopreneur and, and I work hard, but I'm barely making ends meet. I have about as much month as I do money. How can somebody like me start to build wealth? Why don't you speak to the person who's going to count themselves out before we speak to the people that have a little extra to start using? I think the first thing that, that we need to understand is actually wealth creation has absolutely nothing to do with money. As much as people will say it's money, 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 it has nothing to do with money. And in fact, no matter where you are, no matter what your circumstances are, I firmly believe that you don't have money issues. Here's why. I think you have money symptoms. There's symptoms of the behaviors, the decisions, and the choices you made in the past. And that's confronting for a lot of people because they go, wait a second, I got to take responsibility. But here's the empowering part. If they're truly a symptom of choices I've made and decisions I make and my behaviors, all I got to do is change them. 
and I change the outcome. Damn, that hits. People don't want to accept. What do you mean money symptoms? You're telling me these are just symptoms from decisions that I made in the past from a lack of action or taking the wrong actions. I've put myself here. It's not that society is against me. It's not that wages are too low. It's not that inflation is too high. You're telling me it's me and this is my fault? That's a, that's a tough nut to swallow, buddy. Well, so first things first, I tell you this not to take blame, mm-hmm. but to take responsibility. Okay, and they're very different because when I look at a responsibility, that also means I have the ability to respond versus blame, which is just getting the big stick out and beating yourself up. And, and I lived this. So in 2004, I got involved in a uh, an investment. At least that's what it was presented to me as, as an investment. And by 2005, I figured out, uh-oh, Ponzi scheme. Mm-hmm. Here's a financial guy like me that actually would be hired to put people like him in jail to testify. And I got taken, literally wiped out one third of my net worth. Wow. Between me and two buddies, we lost over four and a half million bucks. Okay. So I'm not exempt from bad choices. I'm not exempt from bad decisions. I think that I probably lost more money than some people make in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. What, we need to look at is to say, my current circumstances are not the destination. They just happen to be my current circumstances. And it wasn't until I sat back and asked myself the question, what did I do to contribute to finding myself here? The rules I ignored, the voices I ignored, the criteria that I didn't look at, the due diligence I didn't do, all those things, that's my responsibility. Now, Granted, the guy was a con. He was a thief. But there was some things there that I had to look at and say, I need to shoulder that burden. And when I shoulder that burden in not from a blame standpoint, from a responsibility standpoint, then I have the power to extract lessons from it that allow me to rebuild. And Mm -hmm. so 18 months from that point, not only did I recover what was lost, but we surpassed it by three times. Dang. I love that because it took responsibility. You said, all right, fine. I see where I put myself here. But if I can put myself here, that means I can put myself where I want to go. So that radical responsibility can be a tough pill to swallow at first, but it can also be a very empowering pill to swallow going forward. You have something called the wealth priority ladder. I think this would help to start position people into why they can recover from any decisions that they've made, Yep. no matter what age they are and still end up on the positive side of a financial life that they want to live. Why don't you start walking us through this a little bit? What this is, is the way I look at at money. When you get money, people will ask, well, what do I do with it? You know, Mm -hmm. great, I'm making money. What do I do first? What do I do second? What do I do third? And so this is where we sit back and say, all right, what are the priorities to build wealth? And I think the first thing, so we look at it, and I have seven different levels that that we go through in here. You might sit back and go, oh, it's like Dave Ramsey's baby steps, mm-hmm. okay? And I love Dave and the work he's done, and he makes a huge impact in this world. But it's very different than Dave's steps because Dave is spending time helping people dig themselves out of a hole. Most of the people are sitting back and saying, I'm in a hole. How do I get out? Yeah. So the way they're doing it is let's cut things. I want you to come at it from an expansive standpoint. The way I want you to look at your money is not how to dig out of a hole. Now we can help people do that and there's principles to do that, but this is really about you building your mountain. This is about building your wealth. This is about building a life that's meaningful, that gives you the freedom to to have choice in life. And so this is how that was built. I love Dave. I think he's got a you know, obviously, number one financial show in the world and, and a lot of great advice. You can't poke holes in, in the fact that he is legit. But the thing that I've never been able to resonate with is this cut back, cut back, cut back beans and rice mentality that he promotes no matter what situation someone presents to him instead of teaching people to get bigger than the financial problem in front of them, right? And it's a dangerous mindset and it's a dangerous default to build. You don't want to build a default of, oh, something happened. What else can I get rid of? Oh, something else happened. Oh, what else can I strip myself of? Oh, here's another one of life's things happened. What else can I cut back on? Because pretty soon you run out of things to cut back on and you train yourself to say, how do I get smaller? But Mel, what you do, 
And what I've always been a fan of is training yourself. How do I get bigger than the financial challenge in front of me? And that could be a real challenge like, oh, got these medical bills. How do I get bigger than the challenge? Or it could be like, hey, I've got this thing I want to invest in. How do I get bigger than that challenge? So it doesn't matter if it's negative challenge or, or positive challenge in front of you. When you have a financial challenge in front of you, instead of this building this muscle and this default of getting smaller and smaller and smaller, you should be building the muscle and the default of, ooh, how do I get bigger? And then how do I get even bigger? And how do I get even bigger? Until you're so big and so strong that nothing that life throws at you financially will really phase you anymore. You're so wrong point. It's the difference between looking at something and saying, God, I wish I could afford that and saying, how can I make it affordable? Yep. Oh, I need that. How can I make it happen? Yeah. I love it. Okay. So continue on. So the, We've got the, uh, the, the wealth priority letter here. The first phase is I want people to have breathing room. Okay. So, so the first thing I want people to do is get at least $1,500 or one month's expenses in a high yield cash account. This okay. isn't an emergency fund. This is literally, I don't have to go break the glass. I don't have to go into debt if the transmission breaks. This is simply to sit back and say, how do I make sure I have that? And the, the one way that I have, I'll have people do this and is that they sit back and say, well, how do I get the 1500 bucks or my one month's expenses? Well, I'm betting, like if I went right behind me and looked at all the technology I got sitting in there that I'm not using, I'm putting that on, on Facebook marketplace. I can come up with 1500 bucks. And it is a one-time thing that just gives you some breathing room. So now we can sit back and say, now let's look at the rest of it. Because I know that for the most part, if there's a medical issue, I've got deductibles covered. If there's a car issue, I've got that covered. For the most part, without going deeper in, into debt. So that's the first stage is to sit back and say, let me get my comfort fund in place, $1,500 or one month's expenses. Okay. And is it whichever is greater? 1500 bucks whatever, greater. or one month, whatever is greater? Whichever is greater. All right. So if somebody has one month of expenses of 4500 bucks, they need to get bigger than the problem, right? We're talking about growing, not shrinking. And they need to get radical and find a way. I got to go find a way to create $4,500 and put that into a high yield savings account. Yep. And now you've got that comfort fund in place. And now we can tackle the next phase, which is where we're actually looking at, do I have consumer debt? And do I have what other people call an emergency fund? I call a peace of mind fund. Okay. And the reason I use peace of mind fund is when I have the right amount in there, I just have peace of mind. I'm okay. The market went down 20%. That's, I'm fine. When 2022 hit, we had a 22% decline. It didn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. And I could stay in the game. We've, we've had an increase of, I don't know, 16% this year so far. But here's where the difference is, is that, a lot of people will say, get out of debt first, then worry about emergency fund and investing. I think it's a mistake. Okay? This is where you differ from Dave. So keep going. Yep. So I think it's a mistake because debt management, and I want you out of debt, but debt management is a different muscle group than wealth creation. And here's the other thing we know is that the sooner we start investing, the sooner we get in the game, the more we have time on our side. Because there's one thing that no matter where anyone starts, that all of us have to pass through. If we think about the trajectory of wealth creation, it starts off really flat. Mm -hmm. And then it goes up in a hockey stick. And, and that flat zone is what I call the wealth flat line. Explain a little bit more of that flat zone, the wealth flat line. Yeah. So when you first start putting money away and you may have experienced it, you're, you're putting money in your 401k, you put it in your IRA, you put it in your brokerage account and you're putting a thousand dollars here, a five hundred dollars there. And then you look at it three years down the road and you go, I made 67 bucks. It didn't really grow much. Yeah. And there's this zone in there where it doesn't really grow much because it hasn't reached critical mass. And that's what I call the flatline zone. Okay. This is where people, this is the dangerous place because people get impatient. Mm -hmm. People look at it and say, I just made 67 bucks. Screw it. This doesn't work. And what do they do? They pull the money out. They quit. People they told quit. me to invest in this and it's, it's not growing. Screw it. I, I need that money to go pay off my credit card. Without a doubt. And, and so what happens is that that puts you right back to the starting line. And mm -hmm. so when you start investing again, you actually have to start all over again. The only way to eat up that flat line is time. So you got to power through. 
You can't get tempted by what would feel good. Yeah. Let me ask you this. So many people would say, hey, you know, you got to pay off that 20% credit card instead of making 8% on your money because that's a delta of 12% working against you. How does that reconcile in the plan of debt management over debt elimination in the beginning? Mathematically, yes. You would sit back and say, I'm going to pay the 20% credit card off first. Mm -hmm. The problem for me is that when you do that, you are stalling out Mm -hmm. putting any money away and you're not creating the wealth creation behaviors. Yes, you're, you're paying off debt, which is another behavior you want, but we're not taking care of the, the building the muscle. So even if now what I haven't said is that you split it equally. You may not split it equally. You might sit back and say, I'm going to put 75% towards my debt and 25% towards my peace of mind fund and my, and my investing. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Just know that that's what you're, you're doing is you're doing both at the same time. Because I don't really care from a wealth standpoint, if we're putting $5 away or $105 away, what I care is the muscles getting moved. Okay. This is more about building the muscle then. Yes, it is. It is. Okay. All right. And this getting makes great sense, right? Because mathematically, people can poke a little hole in it. But from a, hey, when are you going to start building this muscle then? If you wait till all your debts paid off, when are you going to start building this muscle? And when are you going to start the, you know, getting on board of this power of compounding interest? Yeah. Well, here's the other, other way to look at it. If I'm 20 years old, every dollar I put away at 20 years old will turn into 80. I'm looking, looking at it real quick. $88 by the time I'm 65. Wow. Can you explain to people why real quick? Because the power of compounding. Listen to what he said. Every dollar you can put away at 20 turns into 88 when you're 65. Yeah. Now, because the power of compounding over time. But let's break it down. So rule 72 says, take whatever your return on investment is, divide it into 72, and that's how many years your money will double, right? Yes. And you're basically saying a dollar turns into two, into four, into eight, into 16, into 32, into 64, into 128, and so on. Yeah. That's how we get there. Exactly. Exactly. Now, let's play this out because this is where you start to realize if I delay putting the dollar in at 20 and wait till 30, it's still a good number, but it's not 88. It'll turn into $23. So, oh, that's a difference. Wait that 10 years. 88 times to 23 times. Let that sink in, folks. And this doesn't matter what age, you don't have to be 20 for this to have, to have a wow factor on you. The point is, go ahead, wait five years, wait 10 years. Look at the difference in multiples from 88 to 23. So now I look at it and say, if I'm paying a little bit of money in and extending a little bit of the debt payoff, but I'm getting an $88 investment versus a $23 investment, I'm going to do that all day long. That's one of the reasons that I kind of look at it the way I do. Not only that, Mel. When you're paying off a debt, you're paying on a balance that's declining. Or when you're paying a percentage, you're paying on a, a balance that's declining. Yeah. When you are putting money into a compounding investment fund, you're earning interest on an amount that is compounding, that's getting larger. Yes. So it's not as simple of an exchange of, well, I better get rid of the 20% while I'm earning instead of earning 10%. It's not that simple. It's because one is a snowball that is melting and the other is a snowball that is growing in a snowstorm. And you want to be able to put I that call money momentum. Behavior. We get we get momentum with our money as it grows. So what if you're hearing this, you're like, well, I'm 40. I'm 40 and I, I have made the bad decisions. I accept the responsibility. It's too late for me. What do you say to that person? Oh, God, I hear this all the time. Here's the thing. What you did in the past is what you did in the past. We can't change it. The next best time to decide to take control of your financial destiny is today. And so even if you're 40, even if you're 50, okay, at 50 years old in today's world, you've still got two decades ahead of you, mm -hmm. okay? So the real question is, what can I do in that time? Because let's say that we set a number. We say, I want to I wanna have $2 million and I'm 40 years old. And you go, well, I'm too late. So do you not try? Because aren't we still better off? If I got to a million two instead of zero, I'll go, Amen. I would rather get 60% of the way there than 0% of the way there. So there's no reason and there's no age to ever stop trying. And I mean, using a simple example, if someone started at 40 
by the time they're 68, based on average returns, their money would have doubled four times. Yeah. So there's two things at play here. Your money could still double four times by the time you're 68. That means one turns into two, into four, into eight. Or that might mean 10 grand turns at 80. Or it might mean 100 grand turns at 800 grand, right? Yeah. So that's point number one. Point number two is this is where you say, we're speaking to solopreneurs and entrepreneurs specifically, because they can get a bigger shovel. Yep. They have the muscles and the talent and the skill and the ability to say, okay, I'm making you know $8,000 a month right now, barely making ends meet. But dang it, if I just made an extra $2,000 a month by creating one more widget, one more thing, one more service, one more whatever, and I didn't touch it other than that was my investment, snowball, not $2,000 a month for that 28 years, plus the power of compounding. Now we're talking about some real money here. Some real big money. Yep. And I think that's the beauty of being an entrepreneur is you have the opportunity to adjust it. You have the opportunity to look back and say, all right, I'm not going to buy something until I create an income stream that actually supports it. Yep. So now I sit back and say, like, even you mentioned about where we live. We live in a nice house and yeah, it costs to live here. But I look and I go, when we did it, we looked at it and says, what's the machine we have in place and will it support it? Not going into debt, not going into, into the hole every month. So we looked at it from the perspective of that whole perspective of how can I make it affordable? Yep. Yep. Is this decision I'm making affordable based on my future goals? Yep. So let, let's, t- let's talk about some sacrifice. You've got some great examples that you and I have chatted about in the past. Our uh, real life stories, right? Yeah. Kid that bought a watch, woman that wanted an office, things like that. And you showing them, wait, that decision wasn't blank dollars. That decision was this much. Walk us through some of these examples, because whether you're 20 or whether you're 40 or whether you're 50, these hit. Yeah. So the first one is, is so I get my hair cut by a 23-year-old kid, you know, and, and he knows what I do. So we're constantly talking about money, investing and all that stuff. So I'm sitting in his chair and he looks at me and he says, hey, man, one of my best friends just bought a $5,000 watch. And I looked at him, I go, really? He said, yeah. Now you and I are watch dudes. So that, you know, okay, I get it. But at 22 years old, what I, I said, how, I said, is he making a lot of money? He says, no, he's, he's 22. He's not making any money. And I thought, huh. I said, what made him do it? He said, well, his buddies thought, it, you know, we all thought it was a cool watch. So he did it because we thought it was cool. I said, all right, so let's do some math. Remember I said earlier that that if you put money away in your 20s, $88. And I said, so he spent $5,000 on a watch. Had he invested that by the time he's 65, it would be $400,000. He spent $5,000 to impress a, a bunch of dudes that probably aren't in his world in three years. And I look at it as he's foregone $400,000 out of his financial future. Wow. That's a... Not a $5,000 watch, it's a $400,000 watch. And that, it yeah. is. And I don't want people to take away, well, you know, Mel's saying not to spend. I actually am not someone that will ever tell someone, well, not very few times will I tell someone not to spend it. All I'm saying is if you're going to spend, make it intentional, make it conscious, and be completely aware of what the overall cost is. Because every money decision we make today should be in service of the lifestyle and the financial future we want tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Amen. Okay, so that's a great example. You got a office example. Someone's like, hey, should I upgrade my office? This, one, this is some, as an accountant, I used to hear these, these kinds of things all the time. And so I happened to be speaking at an event and this person raised their hand to ask a question. And she says, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about getting a new office. And I said, cool. She goes, it's going to cost me about $20,000 more a year. And I said, great. I go, do you need the new office? She goes, no. I said, okay, then why are you going to get the new office? Well, I like it. I can afford it, but I also, it'll save me in taxes. Yeah. And I said, okay, so let, let, can we break this down? Because there's two things here. I said, so you're willing to spend $20,000 to save taxes, but your deduction will save you only, if I just do the math, 7000 in taxes. Just spend 20 to save seven. Exactly, because I'm assuming a 35% rate. So yep. so in, in the end, she saves 7,000 in taxes, but she spent 20 in the end, she's still $13,000 out. 
And to you, you're looking at this $20,000 over a couple of years as I can afford it is 20,000, but you don't need to spend it. What would happen if I put $20,000 away and let it grow? Mm -hmm. Well, at her age, it was going to be 23 times. Ooh. So wait, $20,000 times 23, if I'm doing the math right. 460. Yep. It's another half million dollars. So we have a $400,000 watch and a $460,000 office upgrade, except people saw it as a $5,000 watch and a $2,000 a month office upgrade. Yeah. And you and touched on something. So basically, we saved almost a million bucks right there in those two examples. By the way, I am, my life has been ridden with examples of what not to do when I was young. All of these exact same decisions. It's like you're describing me to a T, by the way. So if someone's hearing this, this is not finger pointing. This is, again, acceptance of, well, nobody opened my eyes this way until this exact point in my life. So now, who cares what I did in the past? I can do it better if I decide to in the future. That's what this is really about. It really is. And just so everyone realizes, I'm you. I did the same thing until I started to understand it and run things through this new financial filter. Yeah. Because you know us. We're certainly not living on beans and rice. We travel. We're, we're taken off to Scotland in October and we're staying at a nice hotel. We're traveling first. I mean, so it's not that we're not spending money, but we're very deliberate on the things that actually matter to us, that give us joy, that give the richness to our life and we're willing to spend on it and we do it wholeheartedly and without guilt. And you can do that with confidence once you know the financial rules. I think that's the kicker is people are like, screw it, it's intimidating, so I'm just going to live a good life. Or they're like, I'm going to cut back because I'm scared of any decisions to any buying. So I'm just going to live this life of nothing and cut back, cut back, cut back. Neither one has to be the answer. The answer is become educated. It's not as intimidating as you think. And once you have that education, now you can make these decisions in confidence. What is for me and what is not for me based on my future goals? You said something. I don't want to skim over this. Talked about the allure of a tax write-off. You know, I see people out there giving advice all the time. Buy a 6,000-pound vehicle. G-Wagons count. And by the way, we have a G-Wagon, but we didn't buy it for the tax write-off. G-Wagons count as a tax write-off. And that's why you should rush out and give all these stupid TikTok advice individuals. Oh, man, right? They're all over reels too. It just makes me cringe when I see it. So technically speaking, are they right? Yes, you can. If you can show the need, you can write off a 6,000-pound vehicle. But are they right in that this is the move you should rush out and make? Well, no, because you have to spend 250000 bucks to get a, a G-Wagon just to save, what, $100,000? So someone came up to you on the street and says, hey, man, I got a deal for you. You give me $250,000. I'm going to give you a suitcase with hundred grand back. Do we have a deal? You'd say, hell no, get out of here. I would do it all day long with them if they wanted me to do that. <laughs> in reverse. <laughs> I'll give you a hundred. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But that's what Here's they're what asking doing. you do. Here's what I would do instead. And in fact, I do this. I opened up a defined benefit plan, which is a pension plan that gives me the ability to put more money away. So instead of putting 250000 into a G-Wagon, I put $250,000 into a defined benefit plan, get the tax deduction, but keep the money, let it grow, tax deferred. And then when I take it out down the road, it's part of my wealth. Yep. Absolutely. But what do you drive? Do you just walk everywhere then? Me, I, <laughs> I do drive a Tesla. <laughs> I mean, we have examples all day long that we could share. The point that we're trying to make is if you become educated, you don't fall for the bad advice. If you become educated, you get to make these decisions of confidence, not out of scarcity. And when you build the muscle of, hey, let's get bigger than the problem, part through our education, part through our action, instead of just cut back, cut back, cut back to the point where all we know how to do is cut back. And now we're too small to handle any problem. When that becomes your default, you become unstoppable financially. Now, you are going to be doing some teaching on this coming up for free, no strings attached. You're putting together a three-day webinar series to do the teaching so people can confidently understand this on a basic level. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I do this once a year, and this is the time I do it. It's called the Affluent Entrepreneur Experience. I do it live. You get an action guide with frameworks and everything, and, and I literally walk you through the principles that you need to know, the processes that you should have, and the things that will accelerate your growth. You'll walk away with the checklist. You'll know exactly what you need to do to be able to go do it. It's truly live and it's truly free. It's not one of these 
bait and switch type of, uh, you know, you got to pay for it or it's a recording. It's not really you or anything like that. Like this is you on their teaching. This is me on their teaching the whole time. Out of, out of the goodness of your heart. Three days in a row. What are the dates? The first one is August 31st. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a Thursday. And then it's the next Tuesday and Thursday. So it's August 31st, September 5th and September 7th. And you space it out so people can hit them. They can yeah. get them on their calendar. And stop I want, this I want to get people to be able to give them time to go through it and even go through the replays. I love that. Yeah. So uh, how do they register for free? So all they need to do, do is go to affluencelive.com and put your name and email in there. I'll send you all the links. We'll send you all the information. You get registered and we'll have some fun. We'll break down some walls. We'll give you some tools. We'll give you some tactics and we'll allow you to to take control of your financial freedom, live life intentionally, and to know that you're on the path that you should be on. Affluencelive.com. That's A-F-L-U-E-N-C-E-L-I-V-E.com. Affluencelive.com, totally free, spaced out so you can attend it. Three days over three weeks. This is a freaking no-brainer, Mel. Yeah, absolutely. And it's fun. We have fun. This is why I love you is because you're willing to take the time to do this when you don't have to do this. And you're providing real actionable education instead of shiny bells and whistles that sound good, but you know, don't move the needle in execution. And you're doing it from a place of abundance and growing instead of a place from scarcity and shrinking. And, and it absolutely aligns with everything that we've taught on the show for six or seven years here now. And you walk the walk and, and you teach the right methods of doing this. So go to affluencelive.com, free education, no strings attached. Any parting words? Just that to live into the fact that it's within reach. It may be a long reach, it may be a short reach. And if we just give you a few tools, a few tactics, and some support along the way, you'll find yourself on a pathway to financial freedom. It is your birthright to just go clean it. So let me, let me really lock it in here. If someone's making $4,000 a month, and they have $4,000 a month in bills. Can they learn something that'll make them wealthy? Yes. If yeah. someone's making 10 grand a month and they have 12 grand a month in bills, they're backwards. Can they learn something that'll make them wealthy? Yes, because it'll give them the tactics to get themselves out of that hole and start to build a mountain. We're, so we all somebody has six figures in debt, college student loans, credit card bills, life happened to them, whatever. If there's six figures in debt and they have a regular income, can they learn something on here that will actually make them say, holy shit, this can happen to me. It's not for somebody else. Without a doubt, because principles are principles. You got that right. And they work. When you teach the right things, they work. No strings attached, guys. No reason to promote this other than you can live a better life. Affluencelive.com. Check it out. Totally free. Mel teaching. Three days. Don't miss this or you have to wait till next freaking year. Buddy, I sure appreciate you being on. It means the world, that not only that you come on and, and, and share some of the, the tips like this, but more importantly, that you create the space to do the very same type of teaching that I enjoy doing, only you are more of a uh, true mechanic of execution. And that's what I love about you, buddy. Thank you, man. It's, so, it's always so much fun spending time with you and serving and being uh, kind of walking this path together. I appreciate you, brother. Well, likewise, I can't wait to get back to uh, Laguna so the dogs can run your, your private beach again. Budo keeps asking. <laughs> All right, buddy. You take care of yourself. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.